and Southside. Hey, this is the last beach weekend, and everybody's gone, all right? I'm glad you're here today, and uh, we all know there's a hurricane coming, and right now it's a Category 5. Uh, the prognosis, it should be a 1 or 2 off our coast by Thursday night. Just stay abreast. We will keep you informed whether we're having church or not. And hopefully it will stay out to sea and we can still have church next weekend, all right? So, glad you're here today. Are you? All right. Let's pray. God, we're going to open the truth of your word today. We want it to be a lamp into our feet and a light into our path so that we can hide your word in our heart. So by through your word, God, and through your Holy Spirit, God, we can be not only obedient, but as we just sang, we can bless the Lord at all times. Lord, forgive us that when things do not go our way, we blame you. And then when things do go our way, we forget to bless you. Lord, we can bless you at all times. Why? Because you are always good all the time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So go ahead and take out your sermon notes, and you will notice every week I also give you a little seven-day-week devotional guide that goes along with what I'm preaching on so that you can have something to reflect on during the week as we make our way through this sermon today. Uh, I'm, this series today we're beginning, it's going to be about a 10-week series I'm calling Reboot, okay? And if you've ever worked with computers, you understand the word reboot. Sometimes your computer locks up, and you got to push the button, power button, and just cause this thing to reboot. Sometimes you download some software or an update to some current software, and your computer says, listen, to make this active, I have to restart or reboot the system so that the software becomes active. So we're going to be using, I'm going to be using a lot of computer terms that you're already familiar with because you deal with a laptop or a desktop or your phone or something all the time. So we're going to be title in this series, Reboot, How We Think. We're going to be looking at a whole new way of thinking in this series. Nothing compares to the power of your brain. Scientists tell us this about our brain. Your brain, your spiritual hard drive, contains 100 billion neurons. It can record 800 memories a second for 75 years and not get tired. Your brain can store 100 trillion thoughts. To me, that's just amazing. That's just amazing. And there's a lot of myths about our brain. I, I did some research just this week. Just to, I'm going to be sharing some of this with you. Because I, I, I was told this growing up. I was told that we only use about 10% of our brain capacity. Any of you ever heard that? Eh, not true. That is a big, big myth. Here's another myth. I was told growing up either you're a left brain person or you're a right brain person. Eh, not true. That has been totally dispelled. Okay. So if you've been using that as an excuse with your spouse, I just ruined your marriage this morning, didn't I, okay? All right. And there's a lot of myths out there about our brain. But one of the great truths about our brain is that God has given us the capacity to use our mind, our brain, to communicate with him, to relate to him, to have a relationship with him. Animals, how many of you have a dog or cat or some pet? You know, we have three Wessies. We have a cat who thinks she's a dog, okay? And... Uh, Dogs have emotions, they do think, but they cannot rationalize. Right now, our three Westies are not sitting at home going, well, I wonder what I'm going to do five years from now. They don't think that way, okay? They, they only live by instinct. Now, our, you can tell when our dogs are happy, you can tell when they're sad. But God has given you a great gift. It's called your brain, your mind. I'm going to use the term RAM, random access memory. God has given you this capacity to store not just information, but also have the unbelievable ability to communicate with him and have a relationship with him. I want to show you a great passage. I don't know if you've read this passage or if you are familiar what God says he does 24-7. Look at this in Psalm 139. How precious it is, Lord, David writes, to realize that you're thinking about me constantly. Now, if you look at the Hebrew constantly, it means every second of your life. God is thinking about you every second of your life. He goes, I can't even count how many times a day your thoughts turn towards me. And when I wake in the morning, you're still thinking about me. Now, we don't always think about God, but he is always thinking about us every second of our life. 
And he's giving you this capacity called your mind, your RAM, your ability to have this relationship with him and communicate with him. So what I'm going to do over the next two weeks is introduce to you the, the series. We're going to look at nine different topics over ten weeks of how we can redirect, reboot, rechange the way we think in life. Because it all comes down to that. It comes down to your thought life, your RAM, your mind, your ability. So let me give you some pointers this morning about how we can do this, all right? And I'm going to give you half of them today, and I'm going to give you the other half next week. And this is just an introduction. And then after, beginning in the third week, we'll take each one of these points and go in depth each week about that specific subject. But how do we reboot our thinking? Here's number one. My thoughts control my life, but I can control my thoughts. And to me, that's a profound statement there. Your thoughts do control your life, but you have the ability to control your thoughts. This is something that we get as being created in the image of God, the ability to control our thoughts, not just be controlled by them. David writes this in Psalm 20, uh, Proverbs 23, 7. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. In other words, what you think of yourself, that's what you'll be. He writes this. Look what Solomon writes in Proverbs 4.23. Be careful what you think because your thoughts can run your life. I want you to circle that phrase, because your thoughts can run your life. Be careful how you think. Your thoughts can not only run your life, they can ruin your life. So circle also the word be careful. He says be careful. Be careful what you think about because your life is shaped by your thoughts. Now, to me, two very important points come from this. One, my life is determined by what I think. That's the first thing. So my life is determined by what I think. If you think bad thoughts, you're going to have bad feelings. You're going to do bad things. If you have smart thoughts, you're going to be more intelligent. You are what you think. Your thoughts do control you, but you can control your thoughts. Here's a second point based on these two Proverbs. He says, be careful. It implies that I have a choice in what I think in my thoughts. You need to ask yourself, does when you're having a thought, does this thought honor God? I mean, you get thoughts from everywhere. You get them from Satan. You get them from watching TV. You get them from social media. You get them from your friends. You get them from the news. You get them from the entertainers. You get them from your friends. You get them from your coworkers your school buddies, you, you get thoughts from all places, all kinds of places. And though they can control you, God says you have the power to control these thoughts. And while at times you don't get to choose what you think because somebody plants a thought in you, you can choose what you do with that thought. And sometimes our thoughts are sinful, sometimes they're bad. So he says be careful what you think. Be careful. Because if you're not, meaning if you don't choose what you're thinking about, it will control you. I mean, I think it's interesting. We live in a world where everybody's concerned about air pollution. We're concerned about water pollution. And I'm all for that. But do you, do you hear anybody preaching about talking about being concerned about mind pollution? Just watch TV. It will pollute your mind. There's a lot of stuff out there that we shouldn't be thinking about. And there's a lot of stuff that can go into our RAM, our mind, that causes us to behave in certain ways because we're not careful about what we're thinking. So here's a question we all need to ask when we get these random thoughts that may not be godly, may not be biblical, and here's the question, do I really want to think about this right now? Someone says something that's discouraging or frustrating to you, you need to say, do I really want to think about this right now? Do I really want to focus, put my mind and attention on what this person just said to me that's discouraging? Let's say all of a sudden you find yourself worrying. You need to ask yourself, do I want to think about worrying about this stuff? Or you feel fearful. You need to ask, do, do I want to sit here and think about how fearful I am? Or you're upset or you're angry. You need to stop and say, do I really want to think about how upset or angry I am? Or you feel discouraged. You need to stop and think, do I really want to think about how discouraged I am? Because your thoughts determine your life. And you can control these thoughts. Nobody's forcing you to think anything. And just like you can change the TV channel, you can reboot your mind to think the way Christ says. Why? Proverbs 4.23, it says, because your thoughts run your life. And if you don't control your thoughts, they will control you. 
And when someone says something or does something to you that angers you, your imagination is going to kick in, your emotion is going to kick in, and then all of a sudden things are out of control. Number two, how do I reboot my life? How do I reboot my thinking? Here's point number two. Every single change I want to make in my life starts in my RAM, meaning my mind first. That's where it starts. Change starts up here. Change starts in your cerebellum, not in your circumstances. Change starts inside of you, not outside of you. We often blame circumstances. We often blame other people. But genuine change starts up here. And so many of the things we try to change in our life, we try changing our behavior, which is external. We try changing our feelings, which are external. And as a result, we never see any adequate change. Look how God tells us where to change. In Romans 2, he says this, do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world. Literally, it says, stop conforming yourselves. The Greek word, New Testament word, translated as conform, is sugimensio. It literally means, it's where we get our English word, scheme. God says, stop scheming with the world and how the world thinks and how the world processes stuff. He says, do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world. But then he tells us what? But let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. I shared this with you a couple of weeks ago. The word transform here is the Greek word metamorphosis. It's where we get our English word metamorphosis. And you know the process. You remember your basic little elementary education. It's where a larva spins a chrysalis. And over time, it becomes a brand new species. It's not a larva anymore. It's a butterfly. It goes through a complete New change. It goes from being one species to another species. It's kind of like what Paul says, be a new creature. Be a new creation in Christ. You're not the same person anymore. Have you noticed that you're either going to conform to this world or you're going to be transformed by it? You're either going to adapt to our culture and your circumstances or you're going to change from having a relationship to Christ. So you're going to be like everyone else or you're going to be more like God. In our little home discussions, we have these discussions. I don't know. When Audrey and I talk that when we grew up, our parents never sat down and explained things to us. Why we shouldn't do X, Y, and Z. They just said, don't. And if you didn't listen, you got punished very quickly. But there was never any discussion as to why you don't do these things. We sit down with Emmy and we talk to her about this stuff. Here's why you shouldn't be doing this. Or this is why you should be doing this. We don't want you conforming. We don't want you living like every other teenager at Hoggard High School. We want you to be different. We want you to be transformed. We want your life to honor God. You can be like everyone else, or you can be more like Christ. You can be brainwashed by our world, or you can reboot your mind through the transforming power of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians, look what Paul says. We are to have the mind of who? Christ. Not the mind of MTV, not the mind of ESPN, go state. It was a good game yesterday. Good game. Sorry, you ECU fans, okay? We're to have the mind of Christ, all right? We can either be like Christ or we can be like our culture. We can either conform to our circumstances or have the mind of Christ. God has given you this spiritual ram, this mind. It all starts here. Look what Jesus said in Matthew 5. You are blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. It starts here. It all starts here. So any change you want to make in your life starts in your thoughts, not in your feelings and not with your behavior. If you try to change your feelings, you'll fail. If you try to change your behavior, you'll fail. It all starts here. Point number three. How do I reboot my thinking? I change how I feel by changing how I think. Have you ever noticed your feelings rebel? Have you ever noticed your feelings can be rather resistant? You don't want to feel a certain way. And you try to force yourself not to feel that way. I mean, think about it. You feel really, really sad. The saying to yourself, well, don't be sad. Be glad. Do you change? No. Our feelings resist that. It's like, A child you've corrected, and they're just bawling their eyes out. I remember my mother used to say this to me. Stop crying or, oh, y'all had the same mama. Stop crying, I'll give you something to cry about. Well, you can't. 
You can't force a feeling. You cannot force a feeling. It's impossible. And when you're having that argument with your spouse, I mean, it's tense, it's hot. In that moment, you don't feel love, do you? Don't lie. You're looking at me. In our house, we honor God in our marriage. No, you don't. No, you don't. And when you're mad with your spouse, Jesus is the last person you're thinking about. He is. Because you can't force that loving feeling when you're mad with your spouse. It doesn't mean you don't love them. It just means you don't feel it. Because our feelings rebel. They're resistant. And you can't force them. So if you're feeling fearful, you're thinking fearful thoughts, the Bible says. If you're feeling depressed, it's because you're thinking depressing thoughts. If you feel anger, it's because you're thinking angry thoughts. If you're bitter, it's because you're thinking bitter thoughts. So the Bible says be transformed. Reboot this thinking of yours. Hit the reboot button. Start over with this. And get a different thought in your mind. So you and I have a choice. And a godly person chooses to reboot, to change that thought. To allow God to transform this horrible thoughts there into the thought he wants. I mean, if you're sitting at home watching TV... I do this every once in a while. I, I turn to some of the other liberal news organizations just to see what they're saying. And there are times I'm ready to rip my TV out of the wall. I, I mean, I, I can get worked up. I'm looking at them going, you, I, I ain't going to tell you what I say, but I, I get really mad at them. I get really mad at them. So what I've learned to do since I have Dish Network, as I just punch in a different news channel, it's at 205 called Fox News. And I'm not angry. I'm not frustrated anymore. And if you're thinking worry, you're going to feel worry. If, you've, if you feel you're depressed, it's because you're thinking you're depressed. If you're feeling lost, it's because you're thinking lustful thoughts. If you feel you're better, it's because you're thinking bitter thoughts. It all starts here. So the Bible says, transform. Allow God to reboot your mind with a different thought. You can't resist a feeling. Because whatever I resist, persists. Whatever you resist is going to persist. So what I do? I reboot my thoughts. And that's what we're going to talk about over the next few weeks in this series. Is how do we reboot our thoughts with very specific subjects like temptation and lust and etc.? We're going to look at all this in depth. David writes in Psalm 42, 6, my heart is breaking. Any of you ever felt that way your heart was just breaking? David says, my heart is breaking. That's what he feels. That's what he's thinking. Now, look what he does. Look what he says he does. Allow God to transform, to reboot his mind. He goes, my heart is breaking, so I turn my thoughts where? To God. He reboots. He transforms. I'm not going to sit here and think about how bad my heart is breaking. So I'm going to turn these thoughts to God. He says, I just rebooted. I allow God to transform that thought. He says, my heart is breaking. I'm not going to be sitting. I'm not going to stay in this situation thinking about how bad my heart is breaking. I'm just going to turn my thoughts now to God. Here's one of my favorite verses found in Jonah 2.7. Jonah says, when I had lost all hope. How many of you have ever felt hopeless in your life? I mean, you just, I mean, you understand Jonah. He's in the belly of a well. I think I'd feel hopeless too. When I felt hopeless. So he goes, I can stay in this thought. I can think this thought. I can feel this thought. Or I can reboot. I can get transformed by the power of God in my mind. Look what he says. When I lost all hope, I turned my thoughts once more to the Lord. Some of you need to write this verse down. You need to make a little memory card. Put it on your dashboard. Put it on your mirror. You need to memorize this verse this week. When I lost all hope, I turned my thoughts once more to the Lord. Jonah says, listen, I had these horrible thoughts. I just felt totally hopeless. See, when you feel hopeless, you make stupid decisions and you do stupid things. 
Hopelessness will drive you to do things you thought you would never do and never say. And Jonah realizes he's at that threshold. If I don't change, if I don't reboot, I'm going to go in a different direction here. So he says, the best thing I can do is turn my thoughts to God in spite of my hopelessness. So I want us to read this verse out loud. Let's read it out loud together. When I had lost all hope, I turned my thoughts once more to the Lord. You're kind of weak here. I bet yesterday watching your games, you yelled and screamed and hollered, didn't you? Let's read it again like you mean it. And if you don't, just fake it to the Lord right now, all right? Let's read it really good, all right? When I had lost... Congratulations, that wasn't that hard, was it? See, you just rebooted. You go, I don't think I'm supposed to speak in church. I remember sitting next to my mother, and I'd start to just, mm-mm, mm-mm. Because, see, we didn't have children's church back then. For you young folks, I went to church when we rode horses going to church, okay? So we didn't have children's church. And I'd start to talk, Mama, uh-uh, mm-mm, mm-mm. Jonah says, I turned my thoughts. David says, I turned my thoughts. Where? To the Lord. That's how you reboot. It's a choice. He says, when I also hope, I turn my thoughts once more to the Lord. Here's your next filler. The way I think determines the way I feel, and the way I feel determines the way I act. It all starts here in the mind, the scripture says. You get thinking a certain feeling. You get thinking a certain thought. That creates a certain feeling. That creates a certain action. So if you can change your thought, you change the feeling, and you change the action. So if you change your actions, just focus on that, you'll fail. If you try changing your feelings, you'll fail. It just doesn't work. So when you're angry, it's because you're thinking angry thoughts, which cause you to create angry actions. In our house, we're, we're out there with our emotions. We don't hold back. Because you can't have a genuine relationship unless you're honest. God understands your feelings. He understands your hurt, your pain, whatever it is. But he says, listen, you've got, you got to change this. Otherwise, you're going to do something wrong. It starts up here in the mind. The way you think determines the way you feel. And the way you feel determines the way you act. Remember the verse we read earlier? Be careful how you think. It will determine the course of your life. So you reboot. How? You put your focus on God. How do I reboot my life? Number four, every behavior I exhibit is based on a belief I have. And the Bible has a lot to say about this, and we will look at that later in that sermon down the road. Every behavior I exhibit is based on a belief I have. Anytime you do something, it's because you have a belief that's the foundation for that. And when you see somebody do something good or bad, it's because they have a belief about that behavior. All of your behavior is based on unspoken beliefs. If, it's, if I'm showing anger, it's because I believe some injustice has been done. If I, I'm acting resentful or defensive, it's because I believe I've been devalued. If I am prideful, maybe it's because I feel I'm, I don't stand up to everybody, so I try to put on a show. Behind everything you do is a belief that fuels it. And if there's something in your life you don't like that you do, or there's some feeling in your life you have that you don't like that you feel, then you've got to get to the source of it. What is the belief behind that? This is why God says what he does in this Old Testament book called Haggai. He says this, think carefully about your behavior. Why? Because what I think determines what I feel, and what I feel determines my behavior. In other words, get to the, look at your behavior. What's the belief you have about it? So you ask yourself, why do I act this way around certain people? Why do I act this way at school? Why do I act this way at work? There's a belief behind or beneath every behavior. And if you will start thinking about what you think about, what is the belief you adhere to, it will help you understand why you do what you do. Why am I acting this way? Why am I believing what assumptions do I have that I didn't think about? Sometimes you do things that you don't realize. And you know, if you're married and in a family, you know what buttons to push. 
with your family members? Do you ever push their buttons? In my family, I know exactly how to push my daughter's buttons. I will say, Amelia, she hates Amelia. Hates it. And if I want to rile her up to see daggers coming out of her eyes, I just say, Amelia. Now, do I know what I'm doing? Oh, yeah. And when you push the buttons in your spouse, your children, you know exactly what you're doing. Because there's a belief here. The belief is, if I say Amelia, I will get a reaction from her. Or, <laughs> y'all probably never do this. This is true confession today. My wife's a public school teacher. Been teaching 40 years. And sometimes she comes home with the teacher hat on. And she talks to me like I'm one of her first grade kids. Because I act like one of her first grade kids at times, okay? All right? And she'll tell me something. And I go, yes, ma'am. I'm on to see Jesus. Why? Because there's a belief I have. The belief is, don't talk to me like I'm a first grader. She has a belief that says, well, then don't act like a first grader. So then we go back and forth with each other. Behind every behavior is a belief you have. And God says, know what that belief is. Because it's fueling that behavior. Because what you think determines how you feel. Let's rephrase it. What you believe determines what you feel, and what you feel determines how you behave. And if you're having a disagreement with your spouse, you probably have done this. Any of you have just been having a, a, a nice argument with your spouse. You're calm. They're calm. It's, it's all logical. Everybody's just sitting there. You're explaining your side. She's explaining his, her side, whatever. You're going back and forth, and everything's great. Everything's great. You're going back and forth, and you're going, we're making some headway here. And all of a sudden, they say something, or you say something, and they go from zero to 100 on the meter for anger. I mean, like in two seconds. You ever had that happen? You think everything's great, and all of a sudden, something comes out of your mouth or out of their mouth, and all of a sudden, you're ready to go to blows. Has that ever happened to y'all? Oh, come on, liar, liar, pants on fire. You know it has. Don't lie in church. This is the Lord's house, all right? You know what I'm talking about. Why does that happen? Because you have a belief that has fueled a feeling now that has caused an action. So if you're upset or if you're nervous or you're fearful or you're sweating or your voice cracks in those arguments or tears come down your cheeks, Here's a question you need to ask yourself. What am I believing right now? Because behind every single behavior is a belief you have that is fueling that, that is causing that. And when something triggers that in a bad way, you react. You think, maybe I haven't been heard, or maybe what I shared wasn't appreciated, or I'm not being treated with respect. A lot of times you get in an argument, you get in a conflict, and at the end of it, you don't, even, you don't even know why you got in the argument. When Audrey and I used to ride together to church, I know y'all have never done this. Because y'all better. We'd get in an argument in the car coming to church. And we're like, <laughs> and we get out of the car. How y'all doing? We're doing just great. Bless you, brother. Love you. Glad to be here. And we put on a show. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So now we drive separate to church. We've resolved that problem, all right? Why? Because what I'm believing, what I think, determines what I'm going to feel. And what I feel will determine how I'll react. Behind every behavior is a belief you have. That fuels your feelings and then causes the action. And you may be overreacting. You may be misreading. I've done that. Audrey says something. I totally misread it. I think she meant this. But she meant this and I react. Look at what Solomon writes in Proverbs. A foolish person will believe anything. But a wise person thinks about what he does. In other words, Solomon says, listen, before you respond, think about what your response is going to be. 
reboot your mind. Allow God to transform that mind so that what comes out of your mouth is godly. So how do I reboot my mind? Number five, anytime I sin, at that moment, I am believing a lie. And we're going to look at this later in our series. Anytime I sin, at that moment, I'm believing a lie. So when you feel a temptation, you need to stop and ask, what's going on here? What's the lie I'm believing? And Satan, he knows how to tempt you. He knows where you're vulnerable. He knows where I'm vulnerable. And we're going to look at later in the series, there's a four-step process he takes you through in temptation and gets you to eventually sin. I'm not going to give it to you today. We'll look at that later in the series. We, if you want to figure out what it is, go back and read Genesis. He did the four-step process with Adam and Eve. And any time you sin, it's because you believe a lie. He feeds you something. God says, don't do this. And you go, Satan goes, you know, isn't that rather unfair of God to do that to you? You're an adult. You make your own decisions. Who's he to tell you how to live? You know, actually, if you did do this, you'd have more fun, more money, more pleasure, more satisfaction, more contentment in life if you did this. This is why he don't want to do it. He's selfish. He doesn't want you to have a good life. He doesn't want you to have a blessed life. It's no big deal. Everybody's doing it anyway. Your whole culture does this stuff. You'll be more happy if you do what I'm tempting you to do. He feeds you a lie. Every sin is based on a lie. And once you realize what he's feeding you, you into that hard drive of yours, your RAM, your mind, you realize it's a lie, it can cause you to respond differently. All of us have habitual habits, bad habits that we do. So you got to reboot. you got to rethink. If you just go along with the culture, you conform. Yeah, you'd be like everybody else, but you're not going to be blessed. God says, let me transform you. Satan is a liar. But listen to me. Here's your next feeling. God never lies. Never. He never lies. Jesus said this in John 8, 44. He, the devil, has always hated the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, it's consistent with his character for he's a liar and the father of lies. Do you realize what Jesus said? Satan can't even tell you the truth. It's impossible possible for him to tell you the truth and what i love about the bible it always tells the truth god always tells us the truth look at what solomon writes in proverbs 14 12 you can rationalize it all you want and justify the path of error you have chosen but you'll find out in the end that you took the road to destruction and death how many of you ever turned into it, go down the street and discovered it was a dead end road i've done that dead end road you ever hit any dead ends in life you thought, well, I'll do this. And all of a sudden, it ended up being a complete failure. It was a dead end. And there's a lot of things we rationalize. I tell you this all the time. When we rationalize, we're making up rational lies. That's all we're doing. And we're rationalizing these lies from the father of lies, Satan. And God says, if you do this, if you do this, I'll bless you. If you don't do this, you're going to pay for it. And Satan comes along, oh, no, no, don't believe him. Don't believe him. He's just not wanting you to have fun. And you know what I'm talking about here. Any of you ever seen anybody, know anybody, that has what I would call self-defeating behavior? They just keep going back to it, going back to it, and it just destroys them more, destroys them more. Why do they keep going back? It's because at that moment, they are believing a lie. They're believing a lie about their addiction. They're believing a lie about this habit. They're believing a lie about their lifestyle. When Satan says, this won't hurt you, it's a lie. Every sin is based on a lie. But if you take Jesus' words in John 8, he says this. Once you know the truth, that truth will set you free. Once you allow God to take your mind and transform it into his truth, you become free. Proverbs 14, 12 says this. There is a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. Satan's ultimate goal is to destroy you spiritually. 
And there's a lot of stuff out there that he will tempt you with, either online or through peers or friends or whatever. And God will say to you, don't do this. Don't do this. And we think he's being unfair. So we believe the lie. And Jesus says, if you take that lie and you believe it's the truth, it ultimately ends in your destruction and eventual death. James writes this in James 1. Temptation comes from the lure of our own inner desires. These evil desires lead to evil, lead to evil actions, and these actions lead to death. In other words, what James said, it's not what's outside impacting you that you've got to worry about. It's what's in here. Every temptation starts here. It doesn't start out in the world. It doesn't start on the computer. It doesn't start online. It doesn't start with a friend. It doesn't start with who. It starts here. Remember what I said to you. Whatever you think determines how you feel, and how you feel determines how you act. And that action can eventually lead to your spiritual death. James said, you and I would not be tempted by such stuff if we didn't think such stuff. If, if we didn't conform our mind to the way the world conforms. If we would transform our mind, we would think differently. So we got to learn how to reboot our thinking. we got to stop blaming circumstances. I hear people all the time, they blame everybody for the bad stuff in their life. No. We get nowhere by blaming circumstances or other people. Because we thought it first, would cause us to feel it second, and we acted on it. So we can blame our circumstances all we want, but we're just conforming to the world. We're not being transformed. We're not becoming like Christ. So when you feel yourself being tempted, let me give you a question you need to ask yourself. What lie am I believing is the truth? What lie am I believing is the truth? Satan may tempt you. You're married. Well, you know, if you just had this affair with this person at your office... You'd be happier. Or you think, well, if we just live together, we'll be happier. If we have premarital sex, we'll be happier. If we wear clothes like everyone else, we'll be happier. This is something we're talking to our daughter about, about how she dresses and goes to school. She is to be different. Completely different. And we, we explain to her biblically why she needs to be different. We just don't tell her, you're not going to wear that. The world says, drink this, take this, snort this, smoke this, shoot this, and you'll be happier. God says, don't do it, because you're believing a lie that will lead to your death. So you need to ask yourself, what lie am I believing is the truth? As a young boy, I used to go fishing. And here's what I've learned about fish. If you just take your fish, fishing rod, and you just throw it out there with nothing on it, I've never seen a fish swim up to it and go, you know, it's just a bare hook. I think I'll bite it anyway. They don't do that. And here's another thing I've learned. You've got to use different bait for different fish. Listen, Satan knows how to bait you. He knows you better than you know yourself. No fisherman just throws out an empty hook. He throws out the right bait to hook that fish. And just like that is true with fishing, Satan knows what to throw your way, what bait will get you, what gets your attention, what gets you to look. Where's your weak spot? The hook is to sin. But what's the bait? What's the bait that causes you to think, causes you to feel, causes you to act? And over the next nine, ten weeks, we're going to look at this in separate sermons on each of these subjects. I gave you five today. We're going to give you four more next week, and we're going to look at these in detail. Satan knows your bait, and he's going to throw it to you. And you got a choice. I can either conform or I can be transformed. I can either believe the lie is the truth or I can accept the truth from God is truth. So it's not it's just time. We need to reboot the way we think. Because it all starts here. Let's pray.